Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about tonight's author, or that is to say, a book available from tonight's author. Tripping Over Twilight, a collection of short horror and supernatural stories, Endless Halloween Nightmares Unleashed. Written by T.W. Grimm and available now on Amazon. You can get yours on Kindle, hardcover, and paperback. The link is in the description down below, and now, on to tonight's story. If there's one thing I hate, it's when a story ends on a cliffhanger. Damn it, I don't want to wait to find out how the story ends. I just, I need to know right here and now. The last time I was out of the farm, Henry had rambled off on one of his tangents and mentioned the gruesome death of one Willie Van Klein, a longtime neighbor who ran an apple orchard down the road. I'd heard him mention someone named Willie Van Klein a time or two in the past, but I didn't know who he was. I wasn't even aware that there'd been an apple orchard in the area. According to Henry, Willie's operation had suffered some kind of catastrophic failure in the early 70s, and Willie himself committed suicide in a gruesome fashion. He cut his own throat with a straight razor. According to Henry, Willie Van Klein's unfortunate fate came with a disturbing backstory. He told me to remind him about it the next time that I paid him a visit. Unfortunately, Real life has a shitty habit of getting in the way of our desires. The better part of a month went by before I was finally able to clear an entire day and drive out for a visit. I picked up a couple six-packs and a bucket of chicken on my way over to the city, and then I burned down the country roadside at 20 over the speed limit and let it bleed, pumping on the stereo. Curiosity was eating me alive. Henry's stories usually unfold organically over the course of our conversation, but I was too impatient to spend half the day talking about the installation of weeping tile and the rising price of feed corn before we got down to story time. Twenty minutes after I rapped on the front door, I had Henry sitting at his kitchen table with a beer in his hand and a wary look in his eye. What are you so fired up about? he demanded. Barely got in the door, for Christ's sake. Can't we just relax? Talk about the weather for a damn minute? Last time I was here, you asked me to remind you about your neighbor down the road, Willie Van Klein. You said, now that's a story. You remember? Here I am, bearing gifts of food and drinks, so tell me the story. Henry goggled at me in surprise. He wheezed. Oh, shit, I said I'd tell you about that. I don't know, maybe not, kiddo. It's not good to speak ill of the dead. I pleaded, come on, Henry, don't do this to me. I never even knew the man, so you're basically talking about a complete stranger from my perspective. Henry still looked doubtful, so I added, You're the one who brought it up. Come on, make with a story, old man. Old man, you're right on the nuts, shitbird. Henry grinned. I suppose you're right. You wouldn't know Willie from a hole in the ground. He died before you were born. He and his wife Ingrid, they're friends of the family. Good neighbors are worth their weight in gold when times are tough, kiddo. Remember that? I shrugged and said, I don't know any of my neighbors. I prefer it that way. Henry snorted. You live in a fancy high-rise in the big shitty. That's <laughs> a different situation entirely. All your neighbors are a bunch of white-collar assholes with expensive briefcates and Ken doll haircuts. Don't be a cranky old bastard, Henry. Not everyone can be a farmer. Like it or not, the world needs white-collar assholes, too. Henry scoffed at this and said, The world would get along just fine without them, as far as I'm concerned. Now, before I begin, I'll go ahead and remind you of something, Mr. College Boy Know-It-All. It's a big, weird old world out there. We don't know jack shit about it. People pull an awful lot of assumptions straight out of their ass, and then they clap themselves on the back for making shit up. As they go. And take the Great Pyramids, for example. Some folks think it'll be impossible for people to create such a thing back then. Other people disagree. And in the end, it doesn't really matter how those pyramids came to be, does it? Space aliens. The work sweat of 10,000 slaves. It don't matter. Because one way or another, they got built. Well, he doesn't give a shit about your beliefs, your perspective. just is. Henry lit a cigarette and let it smolder in his favorite ashtray. A three-pound rectangle of glazed ceramic that was probably fifty years old. He looked at me through the smoke with mild, half-lidded eyes and popped open his beer. 
Ah, oh, fuck it. He sighed. Ain't noon yet, but I reckon it's close enough. Now that orchard, and there's the Van Kleins, that orchard. That was a labor of love. They bought the property in the 30s and planted all those trees by hand. Bank gave old Noah Van Klein a sweetheart of a deal. hundred acres of marble land. With 15 acres of first growth forest. Two irrigation ponds. 20 foot well already dug, cap. Goddamn steel for the price. You don't know the story behind why it was standing unoccupied, that is. No one from the area wanted anything to do with it. Henry heaved himself out of his chair and pulled a couple plates out of the cupboard. Let's get some food in this before we get too deep into that beer. Grab a loaf out of the bread box, would you? Butter's in the dish over there. We sat down to our primitive lunch of meat and bread, and Henry continued talking between mouthfuls of chicken. The last people living at Acreage was a set of uh, Anabaptists, maybe a hundred or so in total, called themselves Brethren. Their leader was a grim reaper-looking son of a bitch named uh, Helmut Schneider. Tall, pale, a scarecrow of a fellow, with a beard that hung down to his chest. They were scratch farmers mostly only growing what they needed, tending to some livestock. Um, um, locals were mostly Catholic or Lutheran back then, maybe a few Orthodox. Uh, they tolerated the brethren because they kept to themselves still. It was rumored that Helmut Schneider was a doomsday fanatic. That, that made people a tad nervous. Having yourself some religion's all fine and good, but fanaticism, that's powder keg. And Helmut Schneider, uh, he was a deeply disturbed man. It was a rumor he'd make his people congregate in the barnyard every Sunday for an outdoor church service. The rain, shine, snowstorm, didn't matter. Emma told anyone who asked that the open sky was the ceiling of God's divine cathedral. He'd yell, he'd scream about the horrors of Judgment Day till he couldn't yell no more. Hey, he'd pick a few people out of the crowd, he'd make them stand in a line. Men, women, children, didn't matter. He'd make them all stand in a line with their eyes closed. And he would beat the living tar out of them with a broom handle for their sins. I snorted, yeah, fuck that. They wouldn't let someone do that to me. That's crazy. Well, Henry mused. I wouldn't either. I suppose most of them didn't know any better. They'd probably born into that life, and it's all they'd ever known. Now, these days, maybe he wouldn't get away with doing something like that for very long. Those were different times. Hell, your own grandma almost broke a wooden ladle over my head. She did it because I kicked over a kerosene lamp while I was horsing around with your dad. I damn near caught the shed on fire. He got a few good whacks of the belt just for being there when it happened. Today, that'd be child abuse. No one even bat an eye over something like that back then. I winced in sympathy and said, Never knew that side of Grandma. That I didn't. Ouch. Yeah, well, I won't say it's the right thing to do, but we'll say I probably deserved it. Anyway. Even though most folks weren't too comfortable with the goings-on at the farm, the brethren kept themselves. Didn't bother anyone. The people left them alone. When the First World War broke out, public opinion started to change. The brethren claimed their religion didn't permit them to enlist. They called themselves uh, conscientious objectors. But, well, they didn't sit very well with most people. That when their own sons were being shipped off to the meat grinder across the pond. Yeah, I can imagine there'd be something like hard feelings over that. Oh, that was just beginning, Henry snorted. A few months after the war broke out, Helmut wakes up one morning and tells his people God came to him in a dream. He says, he says God ordered them to build a giant cross in the middle of their cornfield. The good Lord wanted it to stand at least a hundred feet high, fifty feet across. Crazy old bastard put those people to work that very morning. The cross was sticking out of the ground not more than six days later. Henry put his hand on his stomach and grimaced. He pushed his plate away and lit another smoke. I noticed he hadn't put much food on his plate. He'd eaten even less. I could see in his face that he wasn't feeling well. 
I wondered if the beer maybe wasn't such a great idea. And a nagging suspicion Henry's liver isn't doing so hot these days. Helmut's cross was 110 feet from the ground at the very top. And it wasn't probably the tallest structure in the area at the time. I got an old picture of it in a shoebox somewhere. It's taken some time in the 30s, I guess. In that picture, you can see the cross is made out of tree trunks. Lashed them all together with rope and chains. Dug a deep bastard of a hole, dropped it in. Not even begin to guess how goddamn heavy it must have been. How much cement they must have poured in that hole to make the damn thing stable. Every single man, woman, and child was old enough to help or involved in some way. They worked six days and nights to get that thing in the ground. And on the seventh day, Helmut commanded him the rest. A lot of them just dropped where they stood and slept on the ground. I let out a low whistle and said, Holy shit, that's nuts. So why did this dude think God wanted a giant cross in their cornfield? Did he ever explain it to anyone? According to Helmet, the entire world was about to be submerged in a new flood. Only this time it'd be a flood of murder, madness, and sin. It's like Jesus supposedly took all the world's collective sin into himself. When he was being crucified, Helmet's cross would absorb this flood of evil like a sponge and save our souls from drowning. Guessing he was referring to the mayhem going on in the First World War? Henry gave me a somber nod and sipped his beer. Now, people have been pretty tolerant of these wackos up to this point, but everyone was pretty goddamn mad about this big, crooked eyesore of a cross towering over the landscape. The Reeve of the township came out in person and ordered Helmet to take it down. The Helmet called the Reeve a foul puppet of Satan kicked him off his land. In the end, there wasn't much anyone could do about it. The cross was there to stay. It wasn't long before something awful strange started to happen. The wood kept getting darker and darker in color and it started to smell bad. If you're downwind from the damn thing, the stink just about make your eyes water. People said it smelled like sewage and sulfur. Rotten flesh. Yeah, just an awful stench. I gave him a skeptical look and said, that's really weird. What could cause that? I mean, some kind of, some, some kind of fungus? Henry offered me a cryptic smile and opened a fresh beer. Maybe. In a manner of speaking, anyhow. You know more of this chicken? I patted my stomach and shook my head. Henry cleared the table, his movements slow and careful. I could tell his arthritis was acting up again, but I knew better to ask if he wanted some help. Henry is a proud man, and his independence means everything to him. Henry finished cleaning up and stood at the window for a while gazing into the forgotten past through the dusty panes of glass. Uh, not long after the war ended, the township evicted the brethren from their land for not paying their property taxes. They had to physically drag Helmut out of his cabin. He was ranting that the Lord would demand a blood sacrifice if anyone ever removed the cross. Just screaming a whole lot of Old Testament hellfire brimstone at the top of his lungs. Police tossed him all off the property, told him to beat it. No one ever saw him again. Now straight away, the bank tried to pay someone to take that cross down. But every handyman and contract in the entire country flatly refused to go anywhere near the damn thing. They had a hell of a time trying to sell the land. Not, no one wanted anything to do with it. Not with that fucking nightmare looming all over the fields. After a while, everyone in the area just kind of got used to it. A few more years went by, people started believing that maybe Helmet was right. Maybe it needed to be there. I guess there's no such thing as homeowners associations back then. I smirked, and Henry let out a dry little chuckle. He said, it's human nature. Something unwanted gets introduced in your life, everyone yells about it. And a year or two goes by, everyone gets tired of being mad, starts accepting his new normal more years they're making excuses as to why they actually need things to be that way 
By the time the Van Kleins came along, it was pretty much unanimous opinion amongst the locals. It'd be the best to leave that awful fucking eyesore right where it was. I know Van Klein didn't like that cross one bit, but he didn't want to piss off his neighbors. In the end, he told the bank, so be it. Be damned with that abomination. Maybe the horrid old thing will scare the birds away. Henry wandered back to the table and plunked himself down with a grunt. Not long after that last apple sapling went to the ground, Germany invaded Poland and the Second World War began. And right away, Helmut's cross started rotting again. As the war dragged on, the rotten wood started to lean under its own bloated weight. It snapped and it fell in the evening on August 5th, 1945. Right around the same time we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. It shattered into a million pieces on impact and the smell. Oh, that smell was enough to knock you off your feet. All that was left was a stubby, twisted pole that stuck out maybe eight feet out of the ground. Willie always says it reminded him of a crooked fang, as if years of erosion was slowly uncovering the skeleton of some gigantic beast. A stump always kind of had a low, unpleasant odor to it, but every time there was a major conflict or disaster somewhere in the world, it'd start to rot again. It'd stink to high heaven. <laughs> Henry plunked down his empty can and nodded at the fridge. I'm dry, kiddo. Give me another beer. I'll keep going. I obliged with his command with a muttered curse under my breath. Henry popped the tab and held up the can to a mock salute. Come on now, don't be like that, he grinned. Respect your elders. Anyway, now, uh, Noah passed on in the late 50s. Left the orchard to Willie. He was the only son that stuck around and keep the business going. His dad gave him Sole ownership of the land and the business. There were some hard feelings about that in the family, but it was Noah's final decision. There wasn't much they could do but grumble. Uh, Willie tended the orchard with his family, and the Van Kleins made a decent living as the years rolled by. They were a good family and good neighbors. Henry sat back in a chair with a wince and a groan. He poured a few long swallows of beer down his throat with a trembling hand and stifled a belch. Uh, it used to mean something to be a good neighbor, he said. You looked out for each other. You folks live and all cramped together in a concrete beehive. Hell, you simply can't give a shit about many people at once. Not on a personal level. Back in the old days, your neighbors were a lifeline. They helped you take in the crops at harvest time. and you Drank to each other's health on the holidays. Gently, I interjected. Well... Times change, Henry. Henry slapped his hand down on the table and scowled. Yeah, they do change. Usually for the worse. Times started changing for the Van Kleins in December of 1969. Oh, Willie's oldest son got a draft card in the mail. Came back ten months later in a box. You never seen a broken man as Willie on the day he put Willie Jr. in the ground. He'd always been a big, strong, rambunctious son of a bitch. You know, a man with a big personality. From that day forward, he was diminished. Kind of faded away until he wasn't much more than a shadow of the man he used to be. And all the while, the Vietnam War is raging on. That nasty stump of Helmut Schneider's cross kept rotting away in the background. Stinking like a corpse, almost oozing with death and corruption. And Willie started obsessing over it. Always talking about how ugly it was, how wrong it felt, whenever he was forced to lay eyes on that awful thing. For Willie, the cross was a constant reminder of what happened to his boy. He starts drinking himself to sleep every night. And he's drinking during the day, too. Who's made him mean? Had an idea that maybe he was taking it out on Ingrid and his other boys, you know, getting free with his hands when he was in the bottle. I tried talking to him about it. He told me to mind my own goddamn business. And you could have called the cops, I began. And Henry cut me off with a snort of cynical laughter. In those days, cops didn't care what Pasatina man and his family was. It was considered a personal matter. Ah, yeah. The good old days, I said, and rolled my eyes. I never said it was all roses back then. Henry countered. Society had its problems. No arguing that. 
woman wasn't her husband's property exactly, but it was definitely a junior partnership. I never agreed with any of it. I mean, hell, I believe we should give a woman a crack at running the country for a while. Men been fucking it up for years. Let a woman try her hand at flushing the economy down the shitter. And why the hell not? I gave Henry a sarcastic thumbs up. Very progressive of you, Henry. He grinned and flapped a dismissive hand at me, raising his beer in the other in another mock salute. Yeah, the good old days, he said. I'm going to be a jackass. No Archie Bunker type, you know that. You want to hear this story or not? I nodded, motioned for him to continue. Anyhow, Ingrid finally had enough of Willie's abuse. She took a kid she left in December. Exactly one year after Will Jr. got his draft card. Now Willie was crushed. Came over here the day after she left and bawled his eyes out in my garage, drunk as a skunk. Reeking like a distillery. I kept saying, I never, I never meant to hurt him. It's the goddamn cross, Henry. Can't even get it out of my mind. I can feel my head every minute, every day. I told him, you, you gotta get yourself together. You gotta stop drinking. Maybe she'll come back if you get sober. He just turned away, started crying even harder. Didn't know what else to say to him, so I just stood there quietly, let him get it all out. When he was done, Willie straightened himself up, wiped his face on his sleeve, and said, All I got left is this orchard, Henry. That's all there is. The look on his face was awful, like a soul was decaying right along with the remains of Helmut Schneider's cross. He walked out into the night without another word. I didn't see him again for the rest of the winter. Henry stopped to light a smoke. I squashed the urge to ask for one, trying to quit. Pulled out a pack of Nicorette, and Henry made a sour face. That stuff's like mint-flavored dog shit, he wheezed. I'd rather chew on a goddamn battery. You trying to quit, are you? I said, yeah, it's time to give it up. It's hard. Well, good for you. No sense in paying good money to give yourself cancer. Henry regarded the cigarette clamp between his fingers with disgust. I can't give him up. I tried so many times, I can't do it. I'm gonna be running a marathon anytime soon. Now your dad, he could run like the wind when he was younger. He could run and jump like an antelope. I remember we were down at the gully one time, and I, I, I interrupted his tangent with a polite, <coughs> he had, and added, you're telling me about Willie Van Klein? Stay on course, Captain. All right, Willie, well... I hadn't seen hide nor hair of him in months. So I, I dropped by one morning in early May to check in on him. It wasn't in the barnyard. I heard his tractor running somewhere around the orchard, so I went looking for him. Found him out of the stump. He dug a deep hole around it with a shovel, came walking up just as he was looping the length of a chain around the base of the stump. The other end of the chain was hooked onto the tractor hitch. I waved my hands to get his attention. I yelled, You sure you should do this? Willie hollered back, You're goddamn right, I sure. I stood back and I watched as he slowly tightened up the slack on the chain, inching ahead a little bit at a time. That chain sank into the rotten wood, and Willie gunned the tractor and snap! The stump broke off just above the big block of concrete brethren had poured to anchor it into the ground. It disintegrated when it hit the dirt, just completely shattered into a million shreds of rotten splinters. At least a blast of stench that made me turn and gag. <sighs> Smell like the depths of hell. Henry tipped back his beer, plunked the empty can on the table, and jerked his head at the fridge. I jumped up and fetched us both another round. Henry struggled with the pull tap on the can. He mumbled and attached the scraper blade to the tractor hitch, started filling the hole, watched him do it with butterflies in my stomach. Ugly bastard of a cross had been there for as long as I could remember. Now it was gone. And I had a bad feeling that Willie had made a terrible mistake. And I thought, ah, for Christ's sake, I can't open this fucking thing to save my life. Here, get that open for me, would you? He slid the can across the table, and I popped the tab with mixed emotions. Henry had been doing pretty bad. If he were lowering himself to ask someone else to open his beer for him, that is. 
I made a mental note to buy him a can tab opener. Yeah, thanks, kiddo. Well, a couple days later, Willie came over in a panic. Says, come back to the orchard. I have something you need to see. So I go over there with him, and I'd be damned if there wasn't some kind of blight creeping over the ground where the cross used to stand. Vegetation was withered up, dying off in a rough circle, maybe 50 feet across. Everything inside the circle was curled up, dried out. There was a low, unpleasant stink in the air. It gives me this helpless look, says, started right after I pulled down the rest of that cross. It's spreading fast. I told him, I don't know. Never seen anything like it. Probably fungus. Try spraying it down with a fungicide. Well, he just shakes his head, says, it's not fungus. I ask him what he thought it might be. But he didn't answer. Just pointed at the freshly turned dirt and says, don't you see it? Henry gave me a grim smile and said, Oh, Jesus, I shit you not. That soil turned blacker than midnight. I realized I was standing inside a circle of diseased earth. I jumped right out of it like I had springs on my heels. And Willie ran his hand through his hair. He said, God Almighty Henry, what have I done? I let it all out, all the misery and the death. I let it all out. We stared at each other for a few moments. Then he pointed at the ground and said, look. You can see it spreading. And you could. You could actually see the weeds drooping and sagging for your very eyes. Full of life one second, dying the next. I stood there with my mouth open watching this thing spread, and all I could think was, I gotta get out of these boots right pronto. I didn't know what to tell him, and he said, with his eyes mournful. He'd always been a good neighbor, I've felt awful about what was happening to him, but I had a powerful need to get home and get these goddamn contaminated boots off my feet. And I'll admit, a part of me wanted to sneer at him, say, I told you so, you big dumb bastard. But when other people suffer an unfortunate fate, it's comforting to believe it was their own damn fault in the first place. When you believe that, you could pretend such a terrible thing had never happened to you, because you know better. When other people are suffering, it's, it's easier to be cruel than kind. I blinked at the simple, unflinching power of that statement. Slowly, I said, Henry, sometimes I think you need to write a book of your accumulated wisdom, you know? It'd fly off the shelves. I don't have a wise bone in my body, kiddo. I'm full of bullshit, just like everyone else. Anyway, I can hardly hang on to a pen at all anymore. I ain't writing a book. Shit. Uh, days when I can't even open a beer. You're the writer in the family, not me. You take that bullshit of mine, you write that book, you make yourself a million dollars. <laughs> you have my blessing. Anyhow, I went straight home, I burned those boots out in the fire barrel. Got my clothes in there too, watched it all burning with nothing on but bath towel. When it was all burned to ashes, I got in the tub and I scrubbed myself damn near raw. Couldn't stop thinking that. How far will it go? Yeah, I was scared to answer. At the rate it was spreading, the blight would take over Willie's entire property within a week. Then what? Crawl over the ditch? Jump across the road? Would it reach our own farm? Farther, even? I was scared shitless to find out. I didn't have a damn clue what to do about it. Willie called me a few days later, and all he said before he hung up the phone was, You need to come see this. I told your aunt I was heading over there to help him with some chores. She just scowled and said he's a louse, drinking and carrying on. Slap around his wife and kids. What happened to Will Jr. doesn't excuse any of that. Shouldn't even bother yourself with that man. Make him do it himself. I apologized to her. Made up some bullshit excuse while I had to go. I drove over there in my truck. The first thing I noticed when I stepped out on his driveway was how silent it was. I mean, I... I couldn't get over it. Usually the barnyard would be boiling away with activity this time of year, but everything was still and quiet as a tomb. I knock on the front door, or will it come shambling out onto the veranda? Dirty overalls, pair of big, mirrored sunglasses. Hair looks like a bird's nest. He says, come out of the orchard. See my ruination. 
There was a dirt lane that led up into the orchard. I drove us out there in my truck. I didn't get very far, for I jumped onto my brakes and yelled, Hot damn! at the top of my lungs. I knew it was coming, but I still couldn't believe the sheer devastation I was looking at. I was the entire 70 acres of fruit trees all gone. All those strong, healthy trees withered and shriveled into row upon row of black, mummified carcasses. It was horrific. Not just the trees either, but all the vegetation, grass, weeds, and all. Everything just as dead as dead can be. All of it gone in just the space of a few days. I was speechless. I threw the truck in reverse, turned back for the house. Now I'd seen enough. Pulled up in his driveway and sat there in my truck for a while, not talking to anybody, just sitting there. I slowly realized that Willie wasn't smelling so good. In fact, he smelled downright awful. I thought about how fast the blight was spreading, how it killed everything in its path, and I turned to Willie and I said, I'm sorry, but I think I think you need to get out of my truck right now. I, I have to go. He smiled a little and went, you want me sitting so close to you. I don't blame you. He got out of the truck. He lumbered around the driver's side window. I watched him real close with my hand in my pocket. See, I got your grandpa's thirty-eight special in there. The fact I brought a gun to see an old friend in dire need that says a lot about me. Or a lot about the situation at hand. Probably both. Henry struggled out of his chair and walked over to the big storage closet beside the front door. He hauled open the sliding doors and started digging around inside. Willie leaned down and looked me in the face, Henry said, his voice slightly muffled in the depths of his closet. He said, I'm not long for this world, Henry. It's in me. And he pulled down his sunglasses. Henry emerged from the closet with an old shoebox clutched in his bony arms. He dropped it on the table and pointed to his eye. The whites of Willie's eyes were all rotted with brown and yellow, and each iris had turned from blue to pure black. They were the eyes of a rotten corpse. He stuck out his tongue, and by Jesus, I damn near fainted. It was covered in patches of black and purple and brown like it was decaying in his mouth. His teeth were turning gray at the gum line. I drew back from the window. I said, Holy mother of God, Willie, you need a doctor. But old Willie just shakes his head and he says, You saw my orchard. There's no cure for that. I fucked up, Henry. Thought I'd, I thought I'd release my boy and set him free, but all I did was unleash a plague on this world. I could stop it, but this land will always be tainted. Willie starts crying there, and oh my Christ, his tears look like drops of pus from a septic infection. I bit down on a scream and threw the truck in reverse and gunned it down the driveway. He yelled, You know what I have to do? As I whipped out into the road, but I didn't stop to answer him. I just, I just stomp on that gas pedal and I get the hell out of here. When I get home, I scrub the passenger side of the bench seat with hot water and bleach. Henry sat down and started rifling through the contents of the shoebox. It was filled with stacks of old photographs and Ziploc bags, along with a few miscellaneous trinkets from our family's past. I didn't tell Eustace what happened over there, but... Couldn't stop thinking about those thick green tears running down to Willie's beard. Getting, I was getting ready for bed when it finally dawned on me what Willie had meant when he yelled, You know what I have to do? I said, Oh, hell. I told Eustace I had to go check on something out in the field. I drove down the road to Willie's orchard with my heart in my throat. He wouldn't answer the door. It wasn't locked. He found a line on the floor in the bathroom. He'd cut his own throat wide open with a straight razor. He was surrounded by a big, dark puddle of foulest smelling crap I'd ever encountered before. Before or since. And I just thought, holy Jesus, what the hell is that? That's when I realized it was Willie's blood. Henry uttered a satisfied grunt and thrust a black and white photo into my hands. Here's a picture I was talking about. It's a helmet's cross. 
The picture was smudged and grainy, but it clearly depicted an enormous cross rising out of a sparse-looking cornfield. I squinted at it closely, and I saw that the cross had indeed been constructed from a patchwork of multiple tree trunks. Comparing it to the rows of cornstalks nearby, the cross must have been close to four feet in diameter. A crude and darkly sinister monolith of staggering proportions. There appeared to be a tiny figure standing in the foreground. A solitary speck of humanity wearing a long black overcoat and a hat with a round brim. I wondered if the figure might actually be Helmut Schneider himself. And even though I knew it couldn't have been him, I still felt goosebumps pop out of my arm. The cross was the product of a union between an otherworldly influence and Helmut's own disturbed imagination. Even if he was no longer physically present at the time the picture was taken, Helmut Schneider was a part of the cross, and the cross was a part of him. Henry blew out a deep sigh that ended in a nasty coughing fit. When he was done, he croaked, <laughs> Lily left a message for me on the mirror. <clears throat> Wrote it in shaving soap. I guess he was counting on me being the one to find his body, not someone from a utility company. The message said, burn it down. So, uh, that's what I did. Put a lit candle beside the old sofa in his living room, and then I made a torch out of two by four and some old rags I found in his garage. I walked down to the orchard, I lit up any branches I could reach without stepping inside in that god-awful circle of death vegetation. The trees were dry as cardboard, they went up instantly. And by the time the blight had taken over the entire orchard, Henry said, as he started to draw an invisible map on the table, he was creeping into the woods on one side and was damn near into the ditch beside the road on the other. It wouldn't have been long for it infested the whole country block. And then beyond. And how far beyond? Who the hell knows? All that concentrated evil, so much madness and death, all bottled up, just waiting to be released into the world. The entity that spoke to Helmut Schneider in his dreams demanded a sacrifice to stop the flood. That's exactly what it got. A sacrifice of blood? A sacrifice of hope. Henry lit a smoke and gazed off into the distance. It dawned on me that the tale had drawn to its conclusion, and Henry was probably going to start prattling on about the activity at his bird feeder at any moment. I had a couple of burning questions that needed to be answered first. I waved my hand to get his attention. So what happened to the brethren? They just disappeared down the road? They were, they were never seen again? Henry shrugged and said, oh, Kind of. They moved to another county somewhere close by, from what I can gather. Not long after that, one of Helmut's wives attacked him in his sleep, put a knitting needle through his eyeball. He chased her after with a knife, and she shoved him down a flight of stairs. Broke his neck on the way down. I raised my eyebrows and said, well, shit, there you go. Sure, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Yeah, he was an awful man. No doubt about that. That's not why she killed him. Poor girl claimed that Helmut was regularly convening with an evil spirit in his sleep. To be honest, I can't say she wasn't right about that. I think something awful was guiding the man's actions through his dreams. He believed it was God. Nah, I doubt that very much. Uh, one last question. What happened after you set fire to the orchard? It wasn't there an investigation? Not really. Henry sighed. He looked tired. I told the cops I hadn't seen anything unusual that night, and they believed me. Bolly decided Willie had done it himself or he put the razor to his throat. I don't really know. He never really came back to talk to me again, so I can only guess. I heard Ingrid got the insurance money, so at least some good came out of the horrible mess. Henry put out his half-smoked cigarette and shot a glance at the grandfather clock in the corner. He pressed his lips together in an unhappy line and said, Listen, I appreciate you coming out here like this, kiddo, but I'm not feeling so hot today. I think I want to lay down for a while. Here, did you grab something out of that box before you head out? I keep sick, you know? I said, sure, of course, and blindly reached into the box. I wanted to ask him what was going on, but 
I knew I wouldn't get a straight answer. I swallowed down a sudden lump in my throat and pulled a worn little pocket knife out of the shoebox. I showed it to him, and a fleeting smile skidded across Henry's lips. That belonged to your father. You should keep it. He was a hard man to live with, but you know, he had his reasons. He found it when he was serving overseas in World War II. There's a hell of a story behind that knife. But I'll have to wait for another day. I need to lay down now. Henry showed me to the door and walked down the gravel driveway with lead in my feet and dread in my heart. I don't want Henry to get sick. I certainly don't want him to die. It's probably selfish, but I, mean, I don't care. I don't want him to leave. He has a gift, and when he dies, his gift will die with him. But as Henry said earlier, I'm the writer in the family. It's my job to document the world around me. Better believe I'm trying my best to capture his words before he's gone. I was halfway back to the city before I felt the knife bouncing around in the breast pocket of my shirt. I cursed Henry out loud. He did it to me again, the clever old son of a bitch. He started an interesting story, and he left me hanging. Well, guess I'll have to drop in at the farm again soon and ask about his pocket knife. I don't mind the long drive. I mean, I really don't. In fact, I look forward to it. It gives me time to think. And time spent thinking is never time wasted. Till then, I bid you all good night. If you take away any lesson at all from the unfortunate fate of Willie Van Klein, remember this. Sometimes it's better to just leave well enough alone. Even if well enough doesn't seem so great at the time. No matter how bad things might look, they can always get a hell of a lot worse. For those of you guys that like to listen to stories, which I assume is all of you since, you know, you're here, check out The Chilling App. I keep saying The Chilling App and you can start your free trial, blah, 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 over the past couple of year, years, I think, two years. Well, here's some amazing news for all of you. Chilling is currently introducing Chilling 2.0, which brings in a bunch of new features and a fresh new look. Most importantly, Chilling is now free. That's correct. Free. Not as in start free trial. I'm saying it's free. You can go to it now and it's free. So once again, like I said, start listening free today. There's links in the description down below if you guys can check that out. And if not, then hey, you're the one who's missing out. Once again, that's the chilling app. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Clownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arius, Estabine, Nick Cull, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Love it a Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Paralinia, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Pikamel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricket, Freddy Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Katie's Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming. 